Good to see everybody today. Let me welcome all of you at our Washington campus and online and everybody here at our Winterville campus. Uh, we're continuing this sermon series called Forgiveness and my prayer has been that these, these uh, four, just it's just a few, but that these four messages would have a tremendous impact on us and that there would be a lot of healing for a lot of us. And I, I don't know about you, but I know that for me, I've been putting these forgiveness principles into practice because I keep discovering that there are an unlimited amount of people I need to forgive. How about you? It's like every time I turn around, it's like, yep, I, I, need to, I need to forgive, I need to forgive, I need to forgive. Now, where we've been so far is we've talked about forgiving offenses, which are those little things that turn into big things and cause us to be offended with other people. Um, and I, the thing I've discovered about offenses, I don't know if this is true for you either, but uh, I don't even realize I'm offended until I hear something ugly come out of my mouth about that person. Then I go, I have picked up an offense. Now, the good news is if you can pick up an offense, you can lay it down. And that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, last week, we talked about how to forgive people who have hurt you. And again, there's, a, there's an unlimited amount of those too, and it's always a process. Of course, you might have been surprised by the scripture that we talked about last week. These words came right out of the lips of Jesus. If you are willing to forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you refuse to forgive them, your heavenly Father will will not forgive you. Now, the truth is, unforgiveness for us is like a barrier between God and us. Uh, it, it's a dam. It stops the flow of grace from God to us. And the, the terrible thing is, when you refuse to forgive someone, you actually give them two powers over you. You allow them to continue to hurt you by the exact same thing they did to hurt you the first time. And you allow them to mess up your intimacy with God, which is why we forgive people. Not for them, but for us, for, for our own sakes, because we don't want there to be anything standing between God's grace and us. That brings me to today where we're going to look at another area of forgiveness. I mean, what do you do when you realize that you have, a, you're, you have a disappointment in your heart and it's with God? Or you feel like God has somehow let you down and... Um, that be, you realize you need to forgive God. I mean, can Christian people say that, by the way? Right? Can, that we might actually need to forgive God. Uh, let, me, let me explain. Um, all of us love um, stories that people share with us when something really great happens and it's obvious that God has moved in a mysterious way. You know, someone is healed. Um, someone gets this dream job they've been praying for and we all praise God or someone you know has been waiting a long time and they finally meet that perfect spouse and they're able to get married and, and you know it is a it is a joyous thing all of us love to celebrate stories like that but what if your friend or your family member after you've prayed and prayed, does not get healed and actually maybe even passes away. 
What happens when you are the one that gets laid off and you certainly have been pouring out your heart to God and you figured it would just be a few weeks, now it's been a year and it's like no one will even pick up your resume or it's you that you know, you've been doing everything right, you've been living a pure life, you've been serving God, you've been praying for that right person to share your life with, and they just don't seem to ever materialize. It's like, there are no good men or women out there anywhere, all of a sudden. And all you get are invitations in the mail from other people who are getting married. And you're going, golly, how many more of these am I going to get? When, when is it going to be mine that is in the mail? So, you know, I might say it like this. Um, what do you do when you know that God has the power to do something, but he's yet to do it? Or you know that you've been asking him to do it, and he could do it, but he hadn't done it. And you, all of a sudden, in your heart, you realize you've picked up a little bit of offense. Or you've got a a little bit or maybe even a lot of hurt, and you're actually angry with God. How do you, what do you do when you realize you need to forgive God? How do you get back to a place of reconciliation with Him? That's what I want to talk about today. So, to do so, I want us to look at a a very powerful story in the Bible. This is the story of a woman who had to reconcile some great disappointments with God, which is something that all of us will have to do from time to time. So this is the story of Hannah, and it's in 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there. You could follow along on the insert or even read along on your screen. It says, there was a a certain man whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord... Her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And, of course, this this makes a lot of sense why she would feel this way. Now, two details that help us get into the story. Uh, The first one is, this man's name means something. And in the Old Testament, uh, most of the names there were, were intentional. They were particular names. A lot of times they had the name of God. God is my strength. God is my shield. That people would name their children this. Uh, This man's name, ironically, is God will give you a son. So think about what it would be like to be married to God will give you a son. And say his name every single day. And I'm sure that when Elkanah and Hannah got married, they expected that God would bless them with children. But as time went on, um, she couldn't seem to conceive. And so it was probably then that Elkanah married Penina. And I don't think he did it to hurt Hannah's feelings or to hurt her. It was just, it was simply pragmatic to be able to. Uh, produce heirs, to be able to have children, to pass along his uh, family land and his property to. He was, he was just trying to have children so that he could pass his, uh, his inheritance on. Um, but imagine how this made Hannah feel. I mean, especially in that culture, to not be able to have children, to be you know, the word was barren. Barren was like a curse. You know, barrenness was a curse upon someone. Um, and it was seen to be, you know, God is withholding 
something from you. And it probably made her feel less than useful and maybe even ashamed, although there was nothing <clears throat> that she had done wrong, but <clears throat> she just wasn't able to have a child. And so this was really hard, don't you know, for her? Like, God, you're the giver of life. Why won't you give life to me and let me have a child? Now, the second thing here is like, to make matters worse, uh, not only could she not have a child, but the other wife reminded her every day that she could not have a child. It says that Penina taunted her. Now, this probably would sound something like this. Uh, oh my goodness, it looks like I'm pregnant again. How about that? I'm getting ready to have my fifth child. <laughs> How, or, or Hannah, um, sorry about my children's toys all over the floor. You know how children are. Oh, maybe you don't. I mean, that was just mean as a snake, wasn't it? For this woman to just continue to, to do this. And we, we read later that the family took this annual vacation together. They would travel to Shiloh, which was the place where the tabernacle was pitched. This would have been the forerunner to the, the temple. This is the, the place where you go to worship God. And they would go there regularly and they would do this sacrifice and, and hold a feast uh, at Shiloh with their family. And every year when they would go, that's when Penina would ramp up her taunts. I mean, it'd be hard enough to have to travel with the other wife and all of her children. But when she got there, she made life so unbearable that Hannah couldn't pray, couldn't think, and couldn't eat. I mean, it was, it was awful. So, again, you have to imagine... You can't even, you can hardly pray when you're in, in such a bad place. But Hannah was probably just thinking, God, I can't understand. This, this woman, you give her children, but you won't give me children. Um, I've been faithful to my husband. I've been true to you. This woman is uh, nothing but uh, mean and ruthless. And yet you seem to bless her, but you won't bless me. I mean, I bet every one of us can kind of understand this sentiment. I mean, just understand where Hannah was. I mean, you've prayed. I mean, just think about it. year after year, some of you have prayed for your husband or your wife to come to faith in Christ. And so far, nothing. Or it doesn't seem like there's, doesn't seem like there's any progress or you, you've been asking God, would you help me with my family situation? You know the mess that we're in. Would you intervene there? Would you help me with my marriage? Would you, would you help us with our finances? We're in this constant whirlpool of not being able to meet our obligations. or what it, I don't know what it is, but almost every one of us can imagine just pouring out our guts and coming to the place where all you say is, where are you God in the midst of all this? Then if you've ever felt that way, you know exactly how Hannah felt. Now I think it's, it's interesting when, when people are in a, uh, this dark valley of their soul, and everybody gets there occasionally, people notice and they want to help us. You know, it's just tough to be around a sad person, isn't it? You want to do something, you want to say something to cheer them up or to, to take away their disappointment. The, the problem is when you do, often you just make it worse. Whatever you do, whatever you say, even if it was with the best intentions, it, it just makes it worse. And Elkanah does two things here in this story which were meant for good, but they just end up making things worse. The first one is in verse 4. It says, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, 
He would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Now, by the way, when it says the Lord had closed her womb, uh, I don't believe that God had blocked her ability. I think that people attributed her not being able to have children at that time to like God's non-blessing of her. But there's, there's no place here that says this was God's doing. And often it's not God's doing. So I don't, I don't believe that God had, God didn't want her to have children. No, it just at this point, she had not been able to have children. And so what Elkanah wanted to do was to do something to, to bless his wife. Now this is Hannah, his first wife, the wife that he loved, the one that he married, the one he had all the hopes and dreams with. He just wanted to bless her. And so what you did at the sacrifice is you, you turned over your animal The animal was slaughtered, part of the blood was poured out for the sin, for atonement, and then part of it went to uh, the the tabernacle, to the priest, and, and, and then the rest of it came back to you and your family, and you shared it as a meal. That was part of the worship experience. And so... um, Elkanah made every made sure everybody got some, but to Hannah he gave a double portion. I mean, this was really sweet of him to do. This is what he was saying. Think about this. I love you twice as much. That's what he was saying. I mean, in his heart, he was just doing what he thought was a real blessing. What he must have forgotten or didn't realize is that the double portion at the feast was always reserved for the oldest son, the heir. The heir is the one that the double portion is set before. So every time she got this double portion, all she could think about was, this is for the heir which I could never give my husband. And so it just made it worse. And then, as she would run off crying, it says that, Elkanah did another thing. It says, Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Now, um, let me just say, this is a husband saying something really dumb, y'all. This is a husband who... His wife is crying, and he goes and says, Why are you crying? Don't be sad. That is, that is so dumb. And uh, men, every one of us has done that. And we ought to be asking forgiveness for our, from our wives for being such dolts and doing this. Hey, I know you're really sad, but you ought not to be sad. That's what he says here. Even though this is what Hannah is dealing with every day of her life. (laughs) And so he he says, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? The answer is no. (laughs) No, you don't. Don't you understand? This is my heart and it's broken and you you just don't get it. And you know what? People don't get it, do they? People say the dumbest things to people who are sad. The most inane, uncaring, stupid sounding. They they are trying their best, but all they do is just make matters worse and add to the pain. That's what's going on in this story. This, This is when Hannah does two things, and they are two powerful things, and we need to pay attention to both of them because this truly is the formula for how to reconcile yourself with God and how to come to a place where you can forgive God. The first thing she did, Hannah did, is that she unloaded all of her pain out on God. It says this, once... When they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up 
And now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And really what she did was she poured out everything in her heart to God. She didn't hold anything back. She, can we just say, she lost it with God. She let it all go. Snot, tears, she was throwing things. We didn't say that she, <laughs> she didn't say she was throwing things. But you understand, she, she poured out her honest feelings to God. God, it is not fair. God, it, why didn't you answer my prayers? God, why don't you do what you have the power to do? Which brings me to this truth. That the, the best kind of prayers, the healthiest prayer that you can pray is a completely honest prayer. I mean, do any of us think we can fake God out? Like, God doesn't know what's really in our heart. Like, we can say, you know, I just love you so much. No, I don't. Right? It's, that's what's in there. A completely healthy prayer is a completely honest prayer. So, can we just say it? It's okay to unload on God. Uh, he can take it, by the way. It is perfectly okay to share everything that's in your heart. You can be angry with God. You can be confused with God. You can be hurt. You can let it all fly out. And it's not disrespectful to do so. In fact, all of us know the name David. David, the man after God's own heart, wrote these very words in Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Man, that's raw, isn't it? That's what that is, right? I mean, Jesus' words hanging on the cross were pretty raw and honest. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, if a man like David and if our Lord Jesus can pour out their heart that way, um, I believe that we can too. We can pour out everything that's in our heart. And you know, th the problem with us is that when we're feeling uh, hurt with God, a lot of times we turn away from God, which is exactly the opposite of what we need to do. The time we need God the most is the time we ought to run to God the fastest, but it ends up being the time that we pull back from God. So don't do that. Do a Hannah Instead, you know, back your dump truck up and hit the handle and let all of it flow right down into God's lap. This is the first step of learning to forgive God and reconcile yourself to Him. I mean, look, look at what Hannah did. It says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. This is the priest, right? He's at the door. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. I mean, she's pouring it out here. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Now, Eli could realize that this woman is not just praying this nice little clean prayer, right? She's banging on her chest. She's stomping her feet. She's looking up. I mean, he goes, i never seen anybody pray like that. She was letting it all hang out 
and pouring it out to God. And that's what we need to do too. Now, the second thing she does is also as remarkable. So pay attention to this. She, even though she's in the situation she's in, is she kept on worshiping God even though she didn't find any answers immediately. She worshiped even when she did not have answers. It says, after, after this time she prayed, it says, the entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship once more. She got up and she went to church. She got up, she went back, she bowed down, and she worshiped God again. And her situation had not changed one bit. She still didn't have a child. She still had to live with that mean old Penina. She still had to step over all of her children's toys. She still had a husband who was a dummy. <laughs> Didn't get it. But what she does is that she bows down the very next day and she worships God all over again. She continues by faith to hold on to God even when she doesn't really understand everything. She doesn't see God working. And by the way, you do know, don't you, that just because you don't see God working doesn't mean that God's not working. You know, we, we think God's got to show us every detail along the way, and He doesn't. Because He really wants us to learn to trust Him. Again, this is the time when people, when they're hurt, stop going to church, stop worshiping God, stop seeking Him, and that's exactly the wrong time to do such a thing. This is the time we ought to be seeking Him the most, calling out to Him, grabbing hold of Him. When you're falling apart, that's when you need to hold on to God for everything you got, not run away from Him. See, here's the truth. The truth is that faith is when you can hold on to God even when you don't understand, even when you don't see. Faith is doing something when you don't see it. Faith is holding on to God even when you don't understand everything. Let's watch this video. On June 5th of 2019, we found out that we were expecting our first child and uh, we found out he was a little boy and uh, we picked the name Asher for him. Um, but halfway through pregnancy, we found out that he had a very rare um, heart condition and it ended up leading us to a surgeon in California. So he was born on February 3rd, he weighed seven pounds, seven ounces. He had open heart surgery when he was eight days old, and after that surgery, um, continued to get worse and worse, and he passed away uh, when he was 20 days old. They pulled us into a room on, I think it was the Friday before he died, and they just told us, hey, he's not gonna make it. And we had to make the decision I had always kind of just imagined that I, I wouldn't have to make this decision to let my son die. Um, but for the first time, I just didn't have any answers anymore. And I didn't understand why God was letting this happen. All, all these thoughts are going through my mind as I'm sitting there and then I have to hold my son as, he's, as he dies. I think that was the first moment. I didn't, I didn't really re recognize it at the time, but that was the moment that I began to just become very bitter and very angry at God. We had to walk out of a hospital with an empty car seat and get on a plane to fly home knowing that our son was in a box, like with luggage on a plane instead of with us. And so it just seemed like this God that I knew as this merciful, loving father that there was no way that all these things that he was making us go through, again, it wasn't just the death of our son, it was all these awful things 
that we had to watch and be a part of. And the, the final straw was the fact that we had to make the decision to take him off of life support. I, I lost the ability to care because I, deep down, I felt betrayed. As I was reading scripture every morning, praying that the Holy Spirit would reveal the truth to me in God's word, um, as I'm reading this, I, I read a passage and, um, and it was talking about God's mercy. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just showed me this, this character and this image of who God is. And, and it extended so far beyond any of our circumstances. And, and it was really and truly, it was about the fact that the greatest act of mercy was that he died on the cross for us and that I am living in that today, that I'm never outside of God's mercy in that way. My faith hasn't made sense to me in seven months because of this anger. And now everything that I knew, um, the truth that I knew seemed to just flood back. I'm able to forgive God and to just trust him. I was praying um, kind of with a, a guided prayer time. Um, and I just remember what the, the counselor, Christian counselor told me to say. And he's just like, even though it can't make sense right now, what you need to ask that God will reveal is that, God, I need you to show me how much you love me. It's not going to make sense why this has happened right now. We don't have the full picture, but um, I, God, I just need you to show you show me how much you love me. And I, I did, and I had to say it a few times for me to really truly believe it, but this just rush of peace. I forgave God because it wasn't worth being angry at him anymore because I know he didn't take my son away from me. This, this terrible world is a terrible place, but my God is still good. Robbie and Jordan um, sharing part of that journey. Obviously, those of you that know them, they're st it's not finished yet. They're, they're still all in the, the, the soup of uh, some very raw emotion. Some days are good. Some days are not good. And uh, I know that uh, people want to do something to help them. All right? Just, just when you want to do it, just remember Elkanah and don't do it, <laughs> right? Just, just love them right where they are. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're working through something every single week, right? Every single day. Man, that's how it works when you're, when, when you're in a place where you're just crying out to God. And, and some of you, most of you know because you prayed and you, you know our family. Some of you are new to covenant uh, since then. I mean, Asher, Asher was my grandchild. My, my first grandchild. And, uh, you know, I, I never got to hold him. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of hopes and dreams too of what I, what I wanted to do with my grandson that uh, never materialized as well. And Tef and I went to California, as many of you know, and I tell you, I, I've not prayed my guts out for many more things than I prayed for Asher during that time. And one of those days I was praying, I had a vision. I mean, I, I had a a vision where I was standing on this platform holding my grandson, introducing him to all of you who had prayed. So I, I didn't get to do that. I am getting to talk about him. I did get to see, you know, get to see a picture of him. But, you know, that was, uh, I, I don't think I felt angry with God, uh, I, I do believe that I was uh, incredibly disappointed that things were not 
going to work out that way. I want things to work out for a happy ending, don't you? And that was not going to be the case. And so I'll just tell you, uh, over the years and, and through this, and we're still dealing with this, I'm still dealing with this, but I have learned some lessons that I think are true for all of us as we're trying to reconcile our prayers and how we are, our emotions, and how we're feeling with our Heavenly Father. And uh, I think these, these three things are sort of principles across the board. One is that uh, when things are bad, God is still good. He's still good. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, someone showed me a long time ago when I was going through a major disappointment in my life. Psalm 73, 25. I, it's marked in my Bible. You ought to mark it in your Bible. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. I mean, when it comes down to it, there's nowhere to turn, y'all. I mean, there's nowhere to turn. You can say, well, I'm just going to be mad at God. I'm going to go my own way. Well, that's, that's just dumb. Because there's nobody out there who loves me more. There's no one who's fighting for me more. There's no one who wants to pour out his grace on me more than God himself. And I need to turn to him. Who am I in, on heaven, in heaven or on earth but you, Lord? And I'm going to cling to you even when my circumstances are bad. You know, another thing I've learned is that God never wastes or hurt. I don't like that on the front end because I don't like the hurt. But I always like it on the back end. And I'll just tell you, through, through all of this situation for me, uh, I've learned what a poor pastor I've been to some of you. How I have said things or done things that really they, 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 they weren't what you needed to hear. I needed to be quiet. I needed to just love you more. And I can say that about my marriage. I can say that about my children. I can say that about all, all, a bunch of my friends. Uh, I've learned a whole lot. I'm a different person because I've been through what I've been through. And I'm continuing to learn how not to say and not to do uh, certain things. Um, I, I guess I could say I get it a little more than I used to. I understand a little more than I used to. And then the third thing is that God has a goal for me. And it's that he wants me to learn to trust him. He, just, he wants to... He wants to draw closer to me, and he wants me to learn to draw closer to him. When I'm stuck, when I'm confused, when I've got questions, when I'm angry, when I'm whatever. He wants me to avail myself of his friendship and his love and his care. To seek him, even when I don't understand, and to hold on for dear life until I do. I think that's true for all of us. Now, I would be amiss if I finished this story and didn't tell you about the Cinderella ending for Hannah. Hannah had a baby, which we, we love that kind of story, don't we? She was blessed with a child. His name was Samuel, which means I asked the Lord for him. And Samuel ended up being one of the greatest prophets in the history of the nation of Israel. It's a great story. But I, I will say, we all know the truth. Sometimes you'll have a Cinderella ending and sometimes you won't. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes you'll never have a baby. Sometimes you'll never get married. Sometimes you'll never be healed. Or whatever. Sometimes you won't live happily ever after. Which is why those two steps are so important. Pour out your heart to God. And hold on for dear life even 
when you don't understand. Now, Lord, I, I want to I wanna thank you for the blessing of this story that it's included in your word, which is just an amazing thing, really, that you would see fit to tell this story of Elkanah and Hannah. Thank you. I thank you that it is true that um, you love us more than any of us ever know. If there's any doubt, all we have to look and, and see the sacrifice that you made for us. The sacrifice was that you gave your one and only son for us. That we might have a relationship with you. That we might be forgiven of our sins. That we might be saved. That we might have eternal life. And you've, you've given us promises like, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never desert you. Turn to me. I will turn to you. We're, we're grateful for that. Lord, the, the truth is, a bunch of us who are in this room who are watching today, we're struggling. And we need you so desperately today. I know your hands are reached out to us. We now reach out our hands to you. We don't want to be there to be any blockage between us and you. We need you. You might just say that to God right now. I just really, I need you right now more than I've ever needed you before. You can feel free to pour it all out and to hold on to him for dear life. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.